All right, thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here, and I'd like to share with you uh, why these anti-Christian ideologies are so harmful to the people of God, to the Christian world. And uh, I think I spoke on mo Monday, I, I don't know, all this time, you know, thing, on Monday, right? And uh, I said on Monday that I would be addressing the, uh, uh, the brief history of communism, I mean, how Marxist, now Marxism in nowadays is not something that acts or is not something that is related to the economic field, but to the ideological field. In fact, the most important institutions or foundations of Christianity are under attack by communism these communist ideologies, uh, the family and the church, they are the current targets of the ideological war being waged in our days. We will attempt to understand why. So let's begin with a, with a brief history of Marxism. Marx and Engels' ideas, uh, their idea was to scientific scientifically comprehend how society evolves, how it is structured, and how it develops over time. This is why it is referred to as historical materialism, as it assigns a scientific status to the functioning of society. According to their perspective, the economy held a central whole role in driving societal changes. Society progressed through movements that occurred at an economic level. You know, economy for them was the infrastructure. And then you had the, the ideology, which was the superstructure. For Marx, as economy progressed, ideology, in by ideology, I mean values, culture, education, and other fields would, would also undergo change. So as, so as economy progressed, ideology would undergo changes. So this is Marxism. If Marx was correct, the old idea, the old idea, divide and conquer, which is as old as Julius Caesar, right? This old idea should be applied in economic field. And therefore, an ideological domination would occur naturally. This is why the conflict should occur in the economic field, with the division between employers, employees, or if you want to say that way, bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Right? According to Marx, society would evolve from feudalism to capitalism and then to communism. Feudalism, as you, you all know, was the prevailing social and economic model in Western Europe. It happened from the 5th to the 15th centuries, and it leaves a, a profound impact in the Middle Ages. So this model was based on land, and it served as the foundation for economic activity and social structure. According to Marx, a feudal society would inevitably undergo a bourgeois revolution, transitioning into capitalism. You had feudalism, and then a bourgeois revolution, and then you would have a capitalism. And subsequently, it would, it would experience a workers' revolution and transition into communism. So Marx tried to, tried to create this law of how society works. It would be feudalism, then a revolution, a bourgeois revolution, and then capitalism, and then a workers' revolution, and then communism. So this idea seems to be interesting, but what is the problem? with Marx's ideas. What is the problem? Uh, 
I, I would say that the idea can be even intellectually intriguing. But what is the problem? The problem is that they do not correspond to reality. Societies don't work that way. They don't behave naturally in the way Marx predicted. Furthermore, it was not possible to control the laws of economic. In history, every attempt to implement Marxist theory in any country has resulted in the collapse of the country. This is evident in countries like Cuba, North Korea, and recently Venezuela. So just to provide some perspective, we can compare the number of refugees from Venezuela, a country that still attempts to implement the old Marxist communism, with the number of refugees from countries like Ukraine or Syria that are, in, are currently in war. It's impressive. It's impressive. We are comparing the number of refugees in Venezuela to refugees in other countries that are in war. See, never see anything like that. Venezuela is not itself in war, as you know. But in 1917, getting back in history, we had the Russian Revolution. And Russian Revolution was a counterexample to Marx's ideas. The revolution involved a society that was primarily feudal, with a small bourgeoisie, and it underwent a transition from feudalism to, to communism without passing through capitalism, which was the intermediate phase predicted by Marxist theory. So it's funny because Russian Revolution was a counterexample <coughs> to Marxist theories. Lenin, rec recognizing this, attempted to introduce a more political dimension to Marxist theory. When you study the Russian Revolution, we see Lenin understanding that the action should not be only in the economic field, and he tries to act in the political field, giving to Marxist theory a less economic and more ideological aspect. Then we come to another thinker, and this one is very important, Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci. This tendency of shifting communism from the economy towards ideology reached this peak with Antonio Gramsci. Well, it is through him that we must begin to understand contemporary communism and why it is, central, why it is the central enemy to Christianity. The enemy of communism is not capitalism anymore. The enemy of communism is Christianity. Antonio Gramsci, he was a, an Italian, Italian thinker. You, you know him, Joey? <laughs> he was an Italian thinker. thinker. He was imprisoned uh, under Mussolini's, uh, Mussolini's regime. And uh, he proposed a radical change in his work, prison letters, prison notebooks. He, of course, we wrote during the time he was in prison. He argued that traditional Marxism was flawed in its emphasis on the economic infrastructure as a primary, primary aspect. Instead, Gramsci suggested a very, very different approach. He said, let's attack the ideological superstructure. Let's attack the ideology. Let's attack the values. With Gramsci, the technique of dividing people to conquer, as we saw, is no longer applied to the economy. Instead, it is extended to the ideological, cultural, educational, and values levels. The focus or focus of domination has shifted from dividing between employer 
and employee, employer and worker, bourgeoisie and the proletariat, you know, and it has shifted from this area to the ideology. Do you know how the division is made in, at the ideological level now? How communists divide to conquer on the ideological level, not anymore in the economic level. Now, let's create divisions between men and women, different races, homosexual and heterosexual, geographic regions, northern against southern, the, any, even divisions between different kinds of disabilities. It's, that's very impressive. It's been done in the case of the death, for example, in Brazil. In, in nowadays, there is an understanding that deafness is not a disability. But we all know that deafness is indeed a disability. Deaf individuals require appropriate treatment for their disability, which may include options such as cochlear implants, learning sign language, and undergoing oral training to lip read and speak. Nowadays, deaf individuals are acknowledged as part of a collective community, harder than as individuals with disabilities. They are acknowledged as a community, a collective group. They are acknowledged for having their unique culture and community. Some of them deny treatment in order not to be accused of betraying the community. I've seen deaf in Brazil denying the cochlear implant because he said, no, I'm not going to betray my community. You see? So they divide people. They put deaf in a category, in a group, and they have control over them, saying how they should speak, think and act. From this standpoint, similar to other groups as such as it happens everywhere, women, indigenous people, uh, or even whites with the critical race theory, etc. The post-Marxist communism plays the authority to dictate how these individuals should speak, think and behave. When you are in one of these groups, Communism wants to tell you how you should speak, think, and behave. When I, I lecture in different in Brazil, for example, in different universities, uh, I often ask how many students have taken the Brazilian sign language. Here in the States, you have the American sign language, right? And uh, there is usually a significant number who have taken it. However, I inquire, how many of you that have taken this course on Brazilian Sign Language, how many of you can express at least five words in the Brazilian Sign Language? I tell you, less than 10% can do it. It is puzzling, you know, that after a semester of studying a new language, they struggle to sign even five words. Do you know why it happens? Because instead of teaching the language, the professors, they focus on discussing the social condition of the deaf, forming a commun communist militancy. Do you know where people can learn the sign language for real in Brazil? In the church. In the church. This is how, my friends, identity politics emerge. Your identity is not determined by your true self anymore. Your identity is not determined by your true self, but rather assigned by the group you belong to, with the intention of exerting dominance over, over you. Interestingly, the earlier Marxist theory predicted the eventual elimination of the state. However, 
for post-Marxist and Gramscian communists, they have realized that the state can be a powerful tool in promoting division. As a result, there are numerous state policies that foster division based on race, sexual preference, and other factors. The state has become a tool in the hands of ideological communism to divide and conquer people. This is why contemporary communists embrace the state as its service serves as a driving force behind this so-called identity politics. If you think it, about it for a while, you, you know, right? The idea of categorizing individuals into groups is a form of enslavement. It deprives them of the freedom to be themselves. This communist ideology, which assigns individuals to a collective group based on their identity, treats people as if they were a community of insects. In a recent interview I was watching, I witnessed uh, uh, an interesting exchange between two black individuals and one white individual. One of the black individuals expressed an opinion I don't even remember what the opinion was, but the fact is that the other black individual res responded by saying, hey man, that's not a black opinion. The first black individual was confused and asked, but how come? Is there on an opinion that is black and one that is not? His skin color should not determine no one's opinions or beliefs. However, some people use race as a means of imposing collectivist agendas on individuals, which is a form of enslavement. Only for what I've, I am talking about can one begin to imagine how dangerous the existence of the church is for this idea of collectivism, collectivism communism. How dangerous the existence of church is. In any genuinely Christian church, people have always been treated equally, regardless of the color of their skin. The Christian church is a significant obstacle to the destructive desires of ideological communism. Do you understand how the church poses an obstacle to the destruction that communism's, communism aims, aims to propose? I was talking to my friend, about Galatians 3.28. It is really impressive. It was written when 75% of the population of Athens were slaves. 50% of Rome population were slaves. And we have in Galatians 3.28, Apostle Paul writes, there is no longer Jew or Gentile. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female for all of you are one in Christ, Christ Jesus. These ideologies do not only want our brain and our heart. It's, it's very important, important to highlight this. They also want our soul. Anyone who enters any of these ideologies ends up confused, lost, far from customs and moral values. These ideologies not only seek to capture our mind and hearts, but also, as I said, aim to capture our, capture our souls. Those who embrace these ideologies have lots of problems. You know, different, if you talk about the homosexual thing, the homosexual is a slave of LGBTism. He's slave. He's enslaved by the, this ideology, communist ideology. Any homosexual who behaves differently from what LGBTism says he should behave is brutally attacked. There's a case in Brazil, the uh, congressman who was a homosexual, he was a free thinker, and he was very, very much attacked by the LGBTism. His name is Mr. Clodovil Hernandez. LGBTism is very dangerous. 
very, very dangerous for the kids. Do you know why? Because a child or even a teenager, a regular teenager, they, because they, they don't re, it doesn't require an extensive philosophical or intellectual sophistication to be influenced by LGBTism. LGBTism is very attractive for child and teenagers because they, it doesn't require a sophistication, intellectual sophistication. LGBTism attacks prim primitive impulses, which are those of sexuality. How are these groups enslaved? En enslaved? We talked about this a little bit on Monday. The technique to this comes from another intellectual movement after Antonio Gramsci called the Frankfurt School. We talked about that. Frank Frankfurter Schule. The Frankfurt School established a method that is very important to know. It is precisely the power of language that makes these groups always enslaved. Do you know why? Because in the 20th century, the 20th uh, century thought, a fundamental conclusion was reached, which is as follows. The way you speak, you think, the way you think, you act. Your thinking is shaped, forged, by your linguistic ability. If you do not have mastery of words, you do not have mastery of language. You cannot think outside what you know in linguistic terms. You see that no, they are messing up with language. Until when, until when we will let others to control our words. There are things that you will say today and you don't know if you can use them or not. There are words that you use today and you don't know that you can use them tomorrow. You don't know to have refer to someone. The deaf is one of those. You don't know if you can call them deaf, person with disability, disabled, you don't, you, know, you don't feel comfortable how to address these people, blind people. How you call blind people? You don't know how. how. You are afraid of you use words correctly. Caboclo, for example. I don't know if you are familiar with this name. Caboclo is a technical name for miscegenation. No one wants to say it anymore, which is the technical name that refers to miscegenation. Creole. Yes, this is more common. Creole. No one can say it anymore because it became a swear word. A pejorative meaning was given to the word. This fragility of our linguistic autonomy is perverse. We don't know how to speak, how to express ourselves. The strategy is not only to prevent the use of certain words, but also to empty the content of others. When we empty the content of certain words, we don't know how to think properly. For example, what is normal? I tell you, where I work at the Department of Arts, if someone from the university comes, I'm teaching, and if someone comes in the class with a pineapple on their heads, dressed in whatever you can imagine, the craziest thing ever, I'm sure someone will come up to me and say, Professor, that's normal. I'm not saying that he can dress whatever way he wants. He can, but this is not normal. But they say that everything is normal. You know, even, I even see Christians saying everyone has their own truth. How can a Christian believe that everyone has their own truth? By the way, for Christians, truth is more than a concept, is more than a system of ideas. For Christian, truth is a person, Jesus Christ. LGBTism continues to expand its, its acronym, adding more letters to their name, as you know. It started with, with LGBT and has since evolved to LGBTQ and, and beyond. Q. It stands for queer. 
right? Q stands for queer. Do, does anyone really know what the definition of, of queer is? Do you know what queer is? I know you don't know. You, you don't know because it is meant to have no definition. It is a name that is meant to have no definition. It is a word to say that words don't need to be defined. Anything can fit under that label. It, it wounds and kills the semantics of a word. There is a word that, by definition, is undefined. <laughs> you see the consequences of this in our capacity of thinking. Language shapes thought, and that's why the deconstruction of language is gaining much, so much momentum. There are academic movements, including in Brazil, that just suggests we should not judge a person based on their desire to engage in sexual activities with a child. What is the first step towards? They propose that the term pedophile should not be used and are replacing it with MAP, minor, at, minor attracted person. M-A-P. I wonder if any church will avoid using the term pedophile to refer to a criminal and instead use the term MAP. When you call a pedophile a MAP, you are promoting a mindset that agrees with the destruction of children's lives. We cannot accept this. We cannot accept this. I want to emphasize that it is your responsibility. It's our responsibility not to underestimate the power of language. We have to remember that. We have to, it's a matter of, of life or death. It's a matter of positioning ourselves in the cultural war. It's a matter of safeguarding our family. We are not called to be like those yellow dogs, you know, in the back country that wag their tails from side to side without doing nothing, without doing anything. We are called to take a stand and make a difference in this cultural war. When we convert, I have always thought about this, when we convert, why aren't we immediately taken into, into heaven where there is no pain, suffering, sadness, <clears throat> where none of that exists? Why don't we go straight there? Why does God want us here from our conversion until our death or until the rapture? The only logical answer we have for this is because we have something to do, we have a mission to fulfill. It is not by chance that we are called the body of Christ. In the first, first epistle of Peter, we see the wonder when he says that Jesus is the living stone. Calling a stone alive is already incredible, right? And then he goes on and says that we can also be stones, that we will have the vitality, vitality of these living stones, which is Christ. We will have the vitality not for just anything, but for the edification of the spiritual house, for the mission of the body of the Lord. Is it difficult to do this? Yeah, I know it is. It is difficult. There will be persecutions. But what should we expect? As Spurgeon once said, that we are the salt of the earth. We are not the caramel of the earth. We live to make a difference. Now, if you, we are weak, fragile, staggering, soft, complaining, murmuring all the time, how we will we be able to win battles? We have been positioned. We know that we have been called for. <clears throat> we know the responsibility we have. The promise given to Joshua in one, chapter 1, verse 3, was this. Put your foot down in the land where you put your foot I will give you to you. If we are able to put our foot down, knowing that the Lord's promise will be fulfilled, things will happen. Now, 
we have to take a stand defending the two most precious and important institutions for the Lord, which are the family and the church. Thank you so much.